I thought we would talk today. Hey, Hare Krishna. The the foundation of our we can turn this down a bit. Do we have the we're a small crowd here. I don't want to have anyone feel intimidated. Thanks, Prabhu. The foundation of our world view, those that are following the Vedic path, is Bhagavad Gita. Now, I think many of you may have heard of Bhagavad Gita. Many of you may be following Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita distills all reality down to five principles. These five principles, when mixed together, like if you make a soup, you mix them all together. These are the ingredients of existence. Those five ingredients, I'll give the Sanskrit and the English first, prakriti, which means this material nature, stuff, matter, you know, stuff. Um, next are the, is jiva, which means the individual eternal souls. That's us. If you've ever seen raisin bread, you, who ever seen raisin bread or raisin pudding? You've got the pudding and you've got the raisins. The raisins, or you've got the bread and the raisins. The raisins are distinct. They don't, like oil and water, they don't mix. So you've got the material nature, prakriti, and you've got us. Each of us is an individual, eternal soul, living entity. And that's called jiva, if I didn't say so. Then you've got the Supreme Lord. Ishwara, Ishwara Paramakrishna Satchitananda Vigra, Sanskrit verse. And it means that the, you know, we've got a policeman, he may be controlling his district, then you've got the mayor, then you've got the governor, and you go up and up and up, you get the president, and then it goes up and up and up. So the supreme controller, Paramakrishna, Ishwara Parama, the supreme controller, uh, controller of all things is God or Krishna. So you've got, and then you have a karma. Karma is what each of us is carrying, action and reaction. Jesus says, as they sow with social, they reap. Physicists say every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So there's karma, which is the interaction of us, the individual souls, with matter, with material nature, prakriti, and with each other. That creates karma. And there's different stages of karma. Uh, there's uh, like seeds. There's the seed, and then when it's planted, then it grows, and then it gives fruit. So there's, we're, we are, exp well, we'll get into that in a second. So, and then the last thing of the five, I'll repeat them again quickly. The last of the five is called uh, kala, or time. And it's like the stirring agent. You put everything, so time is mixing this whole thing, pushing everything forward, moving everything along. Time and tide wait for no one. So there's kala, time. There's jiva, us, the individual souls. There's Ishwara, the supreme personality, the supreme controller, God. And there's material nature. And there's karma. So those five elements are the composites that together make existence reality. So we're going to take one of those very briefly and speak about karma. And I'm thinking that what we can do is, I speak here once a month. I think it's once a month. So each month we'll take one of these four till we've done all five. So karma, um, my teacher, Srila Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, he... Oh, there, good, there's a tuck clock. He told a story. <clears throat> it's an analogy. But it makes this point about karma. So there were four travelers on a path. 
And as they were moving along, they um, they passed, and they were, you know, over time, they split up, so each is walking individually. And as they were walking, they each of them came past the ashram or the hermitage of a, of a saintly person, a rishi is what the Sanskrit, but a very learned and saintly person. Not just learned, but also practicing, living. It's, the word is acharya, I mean, one who's, teaches by his example. So they came to this individually, and as people are prone to do, they said, can you give us a benediction? Each of them, as they came, say, give us some blessing, give me some benediction. So the first was a prince, a young prince. And the sage said, may you live a long life. Okay, sounds good, kept going. The next individual to come along was a young brahmachari, a young uh, performing austerities, very, you know, very determined and fixed and accruing many, they call it uh, punya, pious activities, a good stock of good karma and, uh, and uh, even spiritual uh, strength, shakti. So he asked, oh, saintly person, can you give me a blessing? And to the, the prince, he said, live a long time. To this young ascetic, he said, die immediately. Okay, he moved on as fast as he could. The next was a butcher. Hey, you know, phones have an off button. It's a novel concept. And you, you cannot even not answer it. They'll call back. Anyway, Hare Krishna. So the, um, maybe he's waiting for something important. Um, so the next was a butcher. And he told the butcher, don't live, don't die. And the last to come along was a Krishna Bhakta, pure devotee of the Supreme Lord. And the, he asked, oh, sadhu, some blessing. And the sadhu said, live or die. So one, the prince, don't die, live a long time. The young ascetic, die immediately. The butcher, don't live, don't die. And the Krishna Bhakta, live or die. So later on they all met, these four, you know, whatever the, you know, they got to the end of the road and they were, oh, we met, I met this sadhu and he gave me a blessing. This is, and they were a little surprised that each of them had gotten a different blessing. So they thought, was there a priority? Was there a preference? You know, did I get the, you know, 25% blessing and someone else got the 100%? So they said, well, let's go back and find out. So they went back. And, you know, why this partiality? Why, you know, one blessing to another? He said, no, no, no. Just like a doctor gives medicine according to the patient, right? So the sage said, I gave appropriate blessing. He said that the prince was trying to enjoy everything like crazy. And he was a wasted, I think is the word they used, you know, a, a, a pampered, spoiled prince, wine, women, and song. And he was accruing a whole stack of very sinful reactions. Very, you know, if you, if you act cruelly, you know, what do they call roosters come home to ro uh, roost or rest, whatever it is. But they come back in due course of time, things fall back on you. So he, the, the, the sage said, you've got a large stockpile of reactions, you know. What is it that if you see the light at the end of the tunnel, is the train coming at you? So you, you live a long time because when you die, you're going to have, you got a big bill to pay. Buy now, pay later, well, you're going to have to pay up. So better you live a long time before you have to face the music. Then the young ascetic, he had performed great austerities and his next birth was going to be very advanced. Uh, he would either be born in, an, in a higher planetary system. Believe it or not, there are high, just like there's a, even in this, there, there is ants, there's a, dogs and cats, there's 
We saw a mouse the other day in the temple. So there's all kinds of different entities and all different levels of consciousness, even within this small spectrum. There's actually a very vast and tiered universe. So he may take birth in higher planets. He may even obtain liberation. So better he dies immediately. Better you cash in now, because he's a young man. He may be swayed from his path. You know, there's a long line, many, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a long, uh, many twists and turns. So better you cash in now. Better you die immediately. That's appropriate. And the butcher, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but it is a horrible life. I mean, bad smells and covered with blood and whack. I mean, I don't even want to spend, what the, I mean, we just had Thanksgiving. The turkeys aren't too thankful. So it's a horrible life. He told, the, he told the butcher, don't live, don't die. Because his life, you know, was horrible. And don't die, because when you die, he's going to have to pay. It says, just to stiffen your determination to uh, avoid animal killing, in the Padma Purana, which is one of our source books, it says that if you kill a cow, you have to take birth as a cow and be butchered for as many hairs as there are on a cow. Now, we have a small farm in Escondido, and we have some cows there. And believe it or not, there, we get a magazine there called Dairyman's Magazine. It's how to take care of cows. And in one of the devotees, one of the, you know, anyway, one of the devotees there showed me that there was an advertisement for a, an antiseptic scrub. Because, you know, once in a while you scrub down, gets rid of all the ticks, any bugs, any infections on the cows. Love it, actually. It's, a lot, it's like scratching their back. So it, in, the, in the advertisement it said, the average cow has over 2,000 hairs per square inch. So as they say, you can do the numbers, do the numbers, you can figure out the circumference of your average cow, how many square inches, multiply it by 2,000, and, you know, those numbers are turning to McDonald's, so many billions serve. Well, who knows what happens to those people. So don't live and don't die. And then the Krishna Bhakta, the devotee, he said, live or die. And that's because one of the symptoms of someone who's actually... Prabhupada saw, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, my teacher, he saw an advertisement for you're in good hands with Allstate. I don't know if they still have it, but it's got the cupped hands and the house and the nuclear family and the faithful dog Fido. It says you're in good hands with Allstate. So he saw that, or Ralph the dog, maybe. Or Fred, sorry, Fred. <laughs> So he said, uh, you're in good hands. Prabhupada saw that. And he said, he quoted a verse from Gita, Yogeshmam Vahami Hum, which means that the Supreme Lord, he said, you think you're sitting on the floor? I'm sitting in the hand of Krishna. So a devotee, one of the qualifications of someone who has that deep conviction and realization, not just blind faith, but practical realization, that actually there is a Supreme Lord and he's directing the wanderings of everything, every living entity. And just like we're resting in those hands, we're actually resting in the hands of the Supreme Lord. So for some, one of the qualifications of a devotee is abai charan, means they're fearless, having taken shelter of the Lord. There's another verse in Gita, uh, part of it is brahmabhuta prasannatma naso jite nakanchite, which means someone who's realized the self is free from all fear, and all anxiety, and is always tasting great happiness. Actually, I was in the room with my spiritual master one time. We'll get back to karma in a minute. But I was in the room with my spiritual master, and it was a cold day uh, for California, at Southern California, and everybody had jackets and sweaters and caps and all this. We were in his room. Uh, and behind where he was sitting, there was a large uh, leaded window, or whatever you call it, you know, a rectangle window, and the sun was coming through. Um, you know how sometimes if it's cloudy and then the, a cloud will part and there's a beam of light, like a, like a spotlight, you know? It was, it was a golden moment, literally. The 
clouds parted and a beam of light and it came right through that window and it framed it like a square and it shined like a spotlight right on my spiritual master, my teacher, Srila Prabhupada. So he was bathed in this golden light and we were all in the cold and darkness, figuratively and literally. And uh, he caught up. He probably didn't miss a thing. He could understand what we were thinking. And he said, ah, he said, yes, someday you will feel this sunlight just like your lover's embrace. So that's how a self-realized soul, a pure devotee of the Lord, is experiencing the world. They're feeling the loving embrace. Krishna says, I'm the pure taste in water. I'm the original fragrance of the earth. I am the light of the sun and the moon. I am the ability in all. So we do something, we think we'll accomplish something. That's by Krishna's grace. So for a devotee, someone who has that vision, uh, his life is completely sublime. And, well, we'll get into that in a second. I'm just looking at the time. The, and then when a, devo- uh, when a self-realized soul dies... There actually is a kingdom of God. There is a spiritual dimension. So he goes back to the Supreme Lord, to Krishna. Just like the hand has... Why does the shadow... I just tipped it off. Why does the shadow of the hand have five fingers? Don't overthink it, my friends. Who said that? You said that? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because the hand has five fingers. It's, it, so this world, it's ephemeral. It's like a shadow. Everything is changing. Everything is shifting. What is it? Nothing is certain but change. And uh, Krishna says all things are mutable. Uh, This material nature is always shifting and changing. But it is a reflection of the eternal dimension, the spiritual world, spiritual dimension. There we have an eternal form. We have eternal relationships. So for the self-realized soul in this world, he feels the loving embrace of Krishna and his business is helping others. And when he, this life, he gives up this life, back home, back to Krishna. So living or dying. So the, the point I'm trying to make and the point Srila Prabhupada was making is that we all have a choice and we should be aware that how people say, oh, somebody told me one time, well, law of karma is true if you believe it. Well, when I was a kid, there was Mr. Magoo. Is Mr. Magoo still around as a cartoon figure? Anyway, he was blind, half blind. And he would sometimes walk out a window or walk off. You see cartoons, they walk off the roof and nothing happens. Until, oh, they look down and they zoom, then they fall. As long as they didn't know, gravity didn't work. I mean, whether you know it, the, my spiritual master gave the example that When you touch a fire, when someone touches a fire, the fire will burn, whether we know it or not. It's not like a four-year-old kid says, oh, well, it's an exothermic reaction and therefore, you know. No, you touch the fire, it burns. It doesn't excuse. So there's so many laws, laws of chemistry, laws of mathematics, laws of physics, laws of economics. Practically everywhere we look, there's laws, and we depend on them. I mean, we're all pretty much depending on the law of gravity. Anybody bring lead socks to keep them grounded? You know, I mean, or whatever. I don't know what method you would use. But the point is that there are laws. And just, we are, there are physics, you know, the laws determining, you know, objects moving through time and space. Well, we're also an object moving through time and space. Why shouldn't we also be ruled by laws of karma? Why? Somebody, says, uh, somebody said to my spiritual master, well, who witnesses it? There has to be a witness. He said, the sun and the moon. And to God has two eyes, he said. The sun and the moon, one of them is always looking. And there was a kid, about 12 years old, who said, what about a moonless night? I was thinking, make that kid a lawyer. You know, he's immediately found a loophole, you know. But, okay, fine, it's a material example, but you get the idea that the Supreme Lord is witnessing everything. He's in everyone's cheta guru. He's in everyone's heart. So the simple point I'm trying to make is that we're all 
ruled by the laws of karma. And what there, there's a verse in the Gita, one who sees action in inaction, and inaction, inaction, is a true knower of things. Even we may be idle, there's still reaction. There's still karmic reaction. We should do something and we're not doing it. We're breathing. Every time we breathe, we're killing living entities. So the point is that there is always, we are always generating karma unless what determines action, what propels action? Desire. Even, how about this one? You know, have you ever heard you know, that one of the goals of Buddhism is to become desireless? Because then I won't suffer, I won't get entangled in. But isn't the desire to become desireless a self-centered desire? It becomes an endless regress. I remember when I was a kid, I used to go to my grandfather's house and look at National Geographics. And, you know, I'm raised in the West. I had no idea about karma and all of this. And I saw a picture of, it was a Jain master, uh, you know, anyway, uh, in India. And he had a mask so he wouldn't breathe anything, kill any microbes or any, anything. And then he had somebody sweeping in front of him so he wouldn't step on any bugs. And in my little eight-year-old mind, I was thinking, but isn't the person who's sweeping in front of him his agent? So what you really need is somebody sweeping in front of the guy who was sweeping. And then I thought, well, you know, you got a chain of them? How many? And I think, well, the only way they would work is if you just walked in a circle. I thought if you, if, you, if you had somebody sweeping in front of you and you walked in a circle, well, then you wouldn't. You know. In other words, we are always generating karma, and what pushes it is desire, is a desire to enjoy. Now, that's a long topic. We don't have time to go into it. But let me say this. Pic picture a number line. You've got your negative numbers, and you come to zero, and then you've got your positive numbers. You've got that picture in your head, you know, a number line, negative whatever, negative, you know, 10, 9, 8, you know, and it comes to zero. Okay, many people, they go, and, and you find it in every spiritual tradition. They go off to a cave in the Himalayas, or they live on a, you know, a Greek island, you know, and you have to lower everything down in a basket, and they don't mix with anybody. This, you know, Juanipero Cerro, the guy who did the California missions, the man was extremely austere. Okay. Am I waking the neighbors? So, um, even you come to zero, which is practically impossible, the sign of life is desire. Even you come to zero, you can't sustain that. And what does it mean? It's my spiritual master called it spiritual suicide. Just to, to, to have no desire, no activity. So negative zero, negative numbers come to zero. What about the positive field? Are there pos and the the art of bhakti, as explained in Bhagavad Gita, the way to deal with desire and karma is to act one of the first things I heard my spiritual master say, because I was tossing this around in my head, you know, to come to the point of zero and no desire, but isn't it better to have loved and lost than never to love at all? So better some desire, maybe you get a reaction, but you get some pleasure also. So better to be active, but then what about karma? So how to become desireless, but what is that, you know, what is that, you know, state? And he said that the devotees have no desire. I thought, okay, I've heard that before. Then he said, but they have unlimited desires to satisfy the Supreme Lord in loving service. And I thought, there's the answer. To use our desires to please the Supreme Lord, to know the Supreme Lord, to see, if one sees everyone, what makes a family? People get together, family, so many. What makes a family? They have a common parent, generally speaking. And if we accept that Krishna is the cause of all living beings, then immediately we're all brothers and sisters. We're a family. Not only human beings, but dogs, cats, cows, every living entity. 
My spiritual master rang, the be- rang his bell one time because he would translate late at night. And so he had an assistant. And so he had a little bell he would ring to wake up. His, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning or evening, any way you look at it. And his assistant came in and he said, I've been watching this bug. He's trying to climb up my desk and falling off, climbing and falling off. He must be very tired. So there was a little sweet. He would, he would sometimes keep some little sweets on it, like a sand dish, if you know Indy, but it's a nice milk sweet. And he said, uh, he broke off a little piece and said, pick him up and take him outside. He was feeling sorry for the bug. He wasn't advertising, you know, oh, he, nobody else was watching. But he was feeling sorry for this little bug that was struggling and hungry and take it outside. So one in spiritual consciousness the activities are freed. They're active, but they're active in the service of the Supreme. And therefore, there's no karmic reaction, and there's great happiness. So that's a little something about karma. And uh, hopefully, to encourage you to read Bhagavad Gita. If you don't have a Gita, get one now. We've got a stack of moments. Well, how much are Gitas? Five dollars? Ten dollars? Five dollars? I'll make a simple proposal. If you, don't, if you don't have a Bhagavad Gita and you don't have five dollars, you can take one for free. If you have five dollars, you can give it to Govardhan there, Peru, because it just allows us to print more. And you can read it, read five to ten minutes a day. Who doesn't have five to ten minutes? Anybody here? You wait, we wait that long for the light to turn red on the way to work or whatever. So to get a Bhagavad Gita, read five to ten minutes a day. You do that for one month. If you miss a few days, we're not checking. It's an honor system. You read five to ten minutes a day after one month. And if you don't feel a profound change in your life, we'll give you your five bucks back. We'll give it back. I guarantee we got a witness. You're all here. So there it is. So please read Bhagavad Gita. I've just tried to say a little bit about this principle of karma. So are we ready with prashanam? We are. Okay. So thank you very much. I think they're going to pass out the prashad now. And uh, anybody have a question why they're doing that? Don't be shy. And if you don't, yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna to you. Um, when you said the last person, the devotee, did, said live or die. Live or die. Is that because he's dedicating to serving Krishna, so he's not necessarily acquiring bad karma? He's not, he's not building up any karma, and he's enjoying it every step. So this life is happiness, and the future life is ha- He's going to Krishna. So he's happy now, and having in the future. The butcher is suffering now and going to suffer in the future. The prince is having a good ride, but he's going to have to pay for it. And the ascetic is struggling, but he gets a benefit at the end. But it's all temporary. The real thing, if there's a way to actually... We are so conditioned that we think what's happiness I have an itch and I scratch it and I feel a little bit of relief oh that's happiness you know I, 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 I my belly's empty and I feel it my you know you take take a shot don't don't you don't dive in you know don't be shy you can start but It's like stimulus response, stimulus response, negative and come to zero, negative and come to zero. But what if there's a whole level of experience that doesn't depend on sensual stimulation, doesn't depend on, on, on titillating my senses or having my ego stroke, doesn't depend on any of that. What if there's the happiness of the loving embrace of the Supreme Lord by being in his service. And that doesn't, I mean, people could raise their children. You can be a parent and, ra- and, and setting an example and training your child of love of God, setting an example. You can be a teacher, because we've got them. 
You can be a cook. You can, whatever it is, you can learn the art of serving Krishna, the, the art of bhakti, of devotion. So it doesn't, you know, if one has a talent. Look at this mural. Somebody was a painter, painted this mural. So we have a gardener. We have, you know, doesn't matter what you can do. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Anyone else have a question? I think every... Yeah, but I'm not going to say anything until you guys pop open those boxes and start taking prasadam. Yeah, otherwise, then we can just talk while we're taking prasadam. Yeah, please do, because I'll feel badly if you... I'll think, geez, these people are... You just do an inventory? What if... All right. Yeah. We'll Thank just take you for a few. speaking tonight. Um, I had a question you. about your um, the comment you made about there is action and inaction and action and, and inaction and action. Could you it, it, explain that more? It sounds like con- yeah. In other words, we that therefore I gave the example of the Jane Master, and I should have made it clear that. Even we think, well, if I just stop all action, then uh, then inaction, then there won't be any karma. I'll just. But one, the mind is ch- still churning, desires are still churning, and it's a temporary state. The very, how do you know, if it happens, you know, you walk along the beach and you see a fish that's washed up or a seal happened to me one time. How do you know if it's alive? You check on it? Yeah, you give it a little, well, I don't, you don't give it CPR, but, you know, you give it a little poke and see if it moves. Motion is the very symptom of life. So the idea that we can be inactive for any kind of sustained spirit, time is impossible. We can't do it. The very symptom of, of selfhood, of consciousness, is desire and activity and, you know, so... One cannot really be inactive. And yet, so that's inaction, inaction. One who sees that even if you're inactive, action is coming. And action, as one who can see inaction, inaction, means one who acts like a policeman. The policeman is to catch a, a, a speeder. They have to go even faster, isn't it? So on one hand, they're breaking the law. But because they're in service of the government, they don't get it. To, you don't find another cop chasing after that cop and giving him a ticket, <laughs> right? I don't think. So the if one is acting, and it's not just whimsical. I can't just you know. There was one U.S. Uh, general in the War of Vietnam said, "Kill a commie for Christ." Well, I don't know about that one, but if one acts genuinely in the service of the Supreme. And there's guidelines, there's standards, we've got the lives of great saints to follow, we've got the Krishna's guidelines in Bhagavad Gita, so there's a road map. And as long as we act selflessly in the service of the Supreme, there's no karmic reaction for that. Is that? So even though we're acting, there's inaction in the sense that there's no karmic reaction. And even if we're trying to be inactive, it's a temporary artificial state we will not be able to sustain. Is that okay? Yeah, that perfectly explains it. Thank you. Yeah. And again, Prabhupada makes, my teacher makes the point that Bhagavad Gita was spoken to Arjuna. You know, it's a conversation. Krishna takes the role of the perfect master. Arjuna takes the role as the perfect student. It's a dialogue. He takes the role of every person. He asks the questions we should be asking. And <clears throat> Arjuna was not a great, you know, Vedic scholar. Or, although he was very intelligent, but he wasn't a great scholar. He was a military man. He was a prince. Which he was managing a kingdom. He had so many worldly affairs he had to deal with, you know. He was married. He had children. And yet, he became the perfect student and practitioner of Bhagavad Gita. And his quality was that he was a pure devotee. He had no material desire. He just wanted to please the Supreme. One of our kids wrote a poem. 
Uh, he's, he's now 40 years old and works as an accountant and does our accounts once a year for free. But um, he was about six years old, and he, one of the stanzas, one of the lines I can remember, was instead of loving just a dog or a cat, why not love Krishna, who made all of that? So if one actually has that view, which is the truth, that everything is coming from Krishna, everything is maintained by Krishna, everything is meant to be used. If I'm walking behind someone and they drop their wallet, now there's several ways I can react, right? I can think, hey, pennies from heaven. Look left, look right, nobody's looking. I can grab that wallet and go to Reno. I don't know, whatever, you know, Vegas, I don't know, wherever you're going to go. Or, but I'm thinking, hey, you know, they're going to they're gonna see me running the credit card. I'm going to get, I'm going to go to jail. There's always anxiety. If you're a thief, there's always some anxiety. Even if you don't have any moral qualm, you think I'm going to get caught. So there's some anxiety, right? So that's not really the best thing to do. And you may get caught too. And as I said, with the laws of karma, the universal cosmic laws of karma, everybody gets exactly what they deserve. There's a line, what is it? The wheel of justice turns slowly, but grinds infinitely fine. Everybody gets what they deserve in due course. This life, next life, nobody gets away. So, okay, taking the wallet and run is not the answer. I can also think, hey, hey, I don't want to get involved. They'll see me picking it up. Maybe they think I'm a pickpocket. I'm just going to leave it there on the road. I'm not getting involved. No problem. Is that really the right answer? Okay, anyone want to hazard a guess what would be the best thing to do? Huh? Give it back. Way to go, my friend. I've got one honest man in the group. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Give it back. So if we think about it, you know, I was in Prabhupada's room one time, my teacher. And a man was saying, we're going to create life. We're creating, like this Stephen Miller up here at, at UCSD, we've created life. Actually, what he created, he, he you know, put some chemicals together, shot some light through this and that, and they made some amino acid, apparently. Now, amino acid is the building block of protein, and there's so many proteins to make one cell. It's like if I've got, you know the little cap, it goes on your car, on your tire. If I were to make a, a, that cap and say, oh, I made a car. I got a Mercedes. Well, there's a few more steps before, you know. So I'm not really, you know, you're not driving that baby home. So, so Prabhupada was talking to this one man. He was a biologist. And I'm not making fun. I was, anyway, whatever. Um, he was a biologist. First thing Prabhupada said, he was introduced. Oh, he's a biologist. Prabhupada said, poor frogs. You know, because they're always dissecting, you know, which I thought was pretty cool. Kind of redu reduced guy. Um, and I don't want to... F Biology used in humility, in the service of others, not to, you know, whatever it is, uh, in a humble and proper way, is a great thing, you know. So I'm not... It's all in the matter of how it's used. So where were we going with that? Um, so <laughs> Prabhupada said to the guy, um, I, or we're going to create life. So Prabhupada said, okay, if I bring a dead body to you, can you put the right chemicals in the right parts and bring it back to life? He said, nah, we're working on it. Prabhupada said, okay. He said, can, uh, can you make me a fly? Just make me a fly. I mean, it's a simple thing. Actually, if you ever look at it, I mean, they, they straight up, straight down, sideways. It's quite a complicated thing. The, the eyes and how they work. He probably said, make me a fly. And the man said, I can't do that. Prabhupada said, okay. Can you make me a blade of grass? The guy said, well. He said, can you make me a drop of milk? Couldn't really do it. And I was with one of our devotees, and he has, I took him to the doctor, and he has a, a condition that his, his eyes don't make enough tears, so he has to put in artificial, you know, he's a little like a visine or whatever, but these are particularly artificial tears. And the doctor said, that, said to us, he said, you know, they're not really as good as natural tears. 
We can't get quite get the viscosity and the right, you know, but they're the best we can do. So now you can be sure that in laboratories around the world, the best and the brightest are trying to figure out how to make proper tears because there's a huge market. It's a bunch of money if you can do it right. Something we don't even think about, you know, how did that happen? I mean, there were, there's a physicist, and he's at MIT, and he's a theist, actually. And he, he's got a book, I forget the name of it, but it's taught, I think it says Nine Numbers, I think is the name of it. And it's explaining the nine basic, you know, the distance of the sun, the, all different types of things, that det- why there's life on this planet, and why doesn't it completely just implode on itself or spin out. All the different factors that hang it together are profoundly con- uh, complicated and interdependent and calibrated. So if one, again, the best thing to do is give the wallet back. If we recognize that, you know, everything is going by the grace of God alone. I can't even make a blade of grass. I can't make a drop of milk. I can't make tears. There's a joke. And it's Christian theology, but, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, they say that God took earth and breathed life. And this is in Genesis. And, you know, it came to life. It took clay and breathed life. It came to life. That's what they say. So the joke is uh, a, a human being is saying to God, hey, look, we don't need you anymore. We've figured everything out. You know, we've got combustion engines. We've got this, that. You know, we're working on solar panels. We, we don't need you anymore. We got everything. You just take a rest. So being a, a kind and benevolent, the ultimate kind and benevolent, God said, okay, well, let's, before I hand over the wheel to you guys, let's just see how you can do. And uh, what was the test? Well, I took clay and breathed life into it. Let's see if you can do it. So the person starts to get the clay, and God says, hey, hey, wait a minute. Get your own clay. <laughs> My father was a businessman. He said, buy real estate. They're not making any more. So we can't even make a blade of grass or, you know, whatever. We don't even know how we're digesting our food, how our hair is growing. And yet, you know, I'm speaking about people in general and myself sometimes. The arrogance is actually profound that we are dependent on the mercy of the Supreme at every moment. So all we're saying is learn the art of giving back to Krishna. I mean, we cook. We cook and we call it prashadam. It's boga and prashadam. Boga means the raw ingredients. You cook it and you offer it. You offer some prayers of thanks to the Supreme Lord Krishna. And then you take that as prashadam. Prashadam is a Sanskrit word for mercy. And that concept, that way, that's just one example, but that way of living in this world, it just is so much better. You don't exploit, you don't cheat. I'll end you with one last thing because we are going late. Um, my teacher said one time, there's always three levels. Uh, you know, and it's a generalization. But there's always going to be people who are more well-off than us. You know, better, smarter, better health, better looking, more money, whatever. There's always going to be people about on the same level. And there's going to be some people that are not in such a good state as us. It's always going to be higher, same, and lower. So he said that for the materialist, someone who's in a better position, we're envious of. Someone on the same level, we compete with. And someone who's on a lesser level, we exploit and take advantage of. The 1%, the 99%. And if you think about that, J. Paul Getty, who's dead now, we don't know, he may be sitting right here in another body, but he, J. Paul Getty said there's, was the richest man in the world at the time, Getty Oil. And he said there's two types of people in this world. People you pay to stay with you and people you pay to stay away from you. Can you imagine what a miserable state of mind that is? There's no love, there's no compassion, there's no genuine friendship. You just either pay him to stay away from you or pay him to stay with you. Anyway, there's so many examples along that line. So you're either exploiting, competing, or envious. 
Now, how does a saintly person, and all of us have the potential to be saintly. We're all saintly. Our default mode, actually, when we get free from our covering and conditioning, is to be saintly. And how does a saintly person see these three divisions? Because they also see them. Someone who's less than us, more mis misfortunate, then you give mercy, you give kindness, you try to lift up, you try to help. Someone who's on the same level, you're friendly with. You reveal your mind, your friendship. And someone who's better off, you serve, you help, you follow their example. So we have a choice. We can either respect, uh, make friendship, and help, or we can be envious, compete, and exploit. Which world do we want to live in? So that gives you just a little idea of what spiritual consciousness is all about and what this process of Krishna consciousness, the Vedic self realization it's a methodology. It's a step-by-step, -step and anybody can do it. I saw my spiritual master. I met him in 1969. And one of the things that first struck me is that I thought, this person is on a whole different level. Here is someone who is, I mean, there, I, don't, I don't want to take up your time, but I could understand by his observing carefully that this person, like they say, what, doesn't have a mean bone in his body. You know, here was someone who just genuinely cared about everyone. Was someone saying, <laughs> I mean, probably would make front, you know, it was the postman or on an airplane with a steward, whatever it was, people would just open up and just tell their whole life story. It was like Prabhupada was their new best friend, you know. So Prabhupada's assistant said to him one time, he said, Prabhupada, everyone likes you. And Prabhupada said, because I like everyone. People just, they reacted to it. They responded to it. So that was one profound thing, that here was a genuinely saintly person who was on a whole other level of happiness and realization. And then the amazing thing, is that he was saying to me and everybody around me, hey, this is for you too. Come on. Here's how you do it. This is not an exclusive club. It's, it, it's, it's the default mode of every living entity. And here's how you do it. Come on. So it's open for everyone. It's an open secret. And it's easy. Okay. I've gone way too long. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Nice questions, though. Thank you.